I'm going to be talking about integrating Ember into existing sites. Um, I'm James Croft. I occasionally tweet. I occasionally blog. Um, and I work at a company called Minified. We're a small company that help clients develop new products. And we've been using uh, Ember for quite a, quite a while. This was a blog post I wrote sort of back in the early days of uh, Ember, just as the framework was emerging, back when it was called Sprout Core 2. Um, so we've built a few things at Minified using Ember from apps where, like JavaScript only web apps, where Ember's like, where everything's built in Ember, to sites where we've just built small parts of it in Ember, where we've integrated Ember into existing sites. <clears throat> so first I'm going to talk about this like debate that keeps rearing its head between progressive enhancement and JavaScript-only web apps. So on one side, you've got um, people arguing that sites should be accessible without JavaScript. Um, for delivering the base content of the site. And on, the, on the other side, you've got people arguing that the sort of web has moved on and we can treat the browser as a runtime and um, JavaScript-only web apps can offer experiences that <coughs> normal sites can't offer. And it's often presented as this like pick your side type argument. And Ember's clearly targeting, it, targeting itself as a framework for building these JavaScript-only web apps. <clears throat> but the problem is, not everything's a good fit to be a JavaScript-only web app. So in this talk, instead of talking in the abstract about these things, I'm going to walk through a case study of a site that's not a good fit to be a JavaScript-only web app, but a site that I've used Ember on. And I'll show you how and where I'm using Ember and where it's helping me out. And I mean, you could even say that I was using Ember to prog progressively enhance the site. So the site I'm talking about is Endless Rotation. It's um, a side project of mine. And this is a music discovery site for DJs. And it's all based around the concept of uh, DJ charts. So every month, DJs will often produce top tens of the tracks that they're liking that month. And they do it to like give recognition to the artists that produce those tracks and build some hype about the track. And Endless Rotation is a place that people can, DJs can come and chart that music. And it breaks away from this 10 per month format. And the DJs can chart as many or as few tracks as they like. And I use that chart data to drive a recommendation engine to suggest similar tracks. And this site isn't a good fit to be a JavaScript-only web app. So this is what the site looks like. This is uh, the page for a particular track. And you've got a list of which DJs charted the track. You've got an embedded player, so you can click the play button and the YouTube video will start playing of that track. And then down here, we've got um, this section where you can explore tracks that we think are um, similar. So this is a public publicly accessible site where I'm delivering content. And it needs to be crawlable to be indexed. A lot of the traffic comes from Google because um, DJs often ch chart tracks before they've been released. And um, no one's written much about them on the web yet. So um, it ranks quite highly. So that's the source of traffic that I'm not willing to use. And I don't think JavaScript-only web apps are indexable by Google just yet. I think maybe if you build them in a certain way. Um, but people have come up to solutions with this indexing problem. So this is uh, Discourse, which is uh, um, a forum site written in Ember. And they've got around this indexing problem by um, using this no script tag. So if you visit Discourse with JavaScript turned off, then this is, this is the view that you see. Um, it's server-rendered HTML that lives between these no script tags. If you visit with JavaScript enabled, then your browser will just ignore everything between those no script tags. Ember will boot up and render, render this version of the site. Um, so that's one solution, but it sort of seems a bit like double work to me. Like you're rendering things on the server, and then like you're throwing all that away, and then rendering everything again on the client, and like. 
you, you might get some reuse out of your templates depending on how you've set things up, but if, if not, you've got this sort of keeping things in sync between sort of server and client, and um, it's not a solution that I particularly wanted uh, to use. But other people are coming up with the, the solutions for indexing JavaScript-only web apps. Um, some people are like running JavaScript runtimes on the server, pre-rendering the content, pre-rendering the site, and, and, and serving that up. And I think you can structure your JavaScript web apps in such a way that search engines can start indexing them now. I saw something recently about Yahoo might be indexing um, some Ember app. Um, but the, the thing is with endless rotation, like all, all of those solutions are valid, but at, at the end of the day, it's the sort of site that I just wanted to be server rendered. Like, I didn't want to. I didn't want to enforce a JavaScript runtime just for delivering like simple content. Um, yeah, um, just delivering sim simple content down. But but there are trade-offs. So um, I've essentially split the page into essential and like what I class as essential and non-essential content, and you outright won't get some of the functionality if you visit endless rotation with JavaScript turned off, but I'm fine with that. So this is the track page, and then this is the track page with JavaScript turned off. So you see that you don't get the embedded player, um, and you don't get that section where we were showing you the similar tracks. And that w that's not really the main content of the site. Th those are just links off to other pages. There's no new content there. But the, the core content of what makes up the site is which DJs were charting which tracks, and, and that's all still accessible with JavaScript turned off. So given I've got this starting point of server-rendered HTML, um, where does Ember fit in? And why am, I using, why am I using Ember at all? Well, as a starting point, let's consider this track player. So each page has this um, play button. And if you click the play button, then um, an embedded YouTube video pops up and starts playing the track. Um, likewise, if you're on a page that lists um, a lot of different tracks, they've all got play links by the side, and you can click those, and the, the associated video will load and start playing, and start playing the track. Now, you might think that we don't need Ember just for simple functionality like that, just for loading and playing a YouTube video. But over time, like this track player is evolved and um, turned into more of like a playlist manager where you can enqueue multiple tracks. It keeps track of the current, it keeps track of the currently playing track, um, allows you to reorder tracks, um, load, save playlists, remove tracks. And I've got more functionality planned for it. And when you're building sort of more complex JavaScript um, functionality like this, it's nice to be able to lean on um, the Ember framework. Because there's a lot of good stuff in Ember, like the um, like it, there's a lot of good stuff in the core Ember um, object model, like bindings, observers, computer properties, and the the run loop that sort of buffers these changes for you and things. And this is what first attracted me to Ember in the first place was this object model that I could build things on. Like back then, there wasn't the the router and um, which rendered the templates for you and things. You just sort of created things with this uh, base object model and uh, built, built your stuff out from there. So with the question of that track player, um, how would we build that? Well, this, this could be one approach. Um, apologies for the coffee script here, but um, I've defined a track player component. And when it's inserted into the DOM, um, this setup player function runs. This will create an instance of the YouTube player. And then we've just got this um, observer that's observing the video ID property of the, um, of, of, of the track. And whenever that changes, uh, we'll load the new track into the player. So we've got also defined a, tr a track controller. And in our, in our template, we can just um, wire up this component such that the track property is bound to the track controller. So all that needs to happen to start playing a video is that we change the 
content of the track controller. Um, we give the track controller like an object with a video with a video ID property, and and the um, video will start playing. So how do we how do we populate the content of that track controller? Well, if we had an Ember app, we'd most likely do something like this. So at, s at some point, we'd have um, a list of tracks. I'm saying here that they'd be in the tracks controller. And we could loop over each track in that controller and render out um, a, a list element and um, this play link. And we'd, we're using the handlebars action helper um, to attach an action to the play link such that when that link is clicked, this um, play track event will fire and we can handle that action somewhere um, in our application, either in a controller or in a route. Here I'm handling it in the application route and I'm just setting the content of the track controller. That will make our video start playing. But the problem is, um, on endless rotation, like Ember isn't rendering these links. Ember isn't rendering these play links, so we can't use this action helper where the the links are rendered by the server um, and are on the page and rendered before Ember Ember e even initializes. So this is the HTML that the server's serving up. Similar, we got this uh, we got this play link and we've given it a couple of extra attributes like the artist and the and the title, given it the class of play, and so. Just on the JavaScript on the page, we can define um, an event handler for this play link, such that when it's clicked, we can pull the data off that link, we can look up the video ID on YouTube, we can create our track, and then all we need to do is get our track into the application. We need to populate the content of that track controller. So one solution would be this. Um, because because we're outside the con confines of our Ember app here, all, all we can see about our Ember app is this like app global variable. Um, this is like our only route into our Ember app. And we can from that we can get the container and look up the track controller and then we can set the content of the track controller. And that that does what we want, but like we're using this. We're using this double underscore container. And we know this is bad because um, Tom Dale said, every time they see someone using this double un underscore container, they'll just add another pair of underscores. But from outside the confines of our Ember app, like, that's the only way that we can dra uh, grab a handle on the track controller. But there's a workaround in this case. Um, so this is our event handler. And we can just pick up this code and move it into the confines of our Ember app. We can put it in an initializer. Um, and in the initializer, we have access to our container. And this is like, this is a guilt-free container. Like, there's no underscores here. So we can, we can do the same thing. We can look up the track controller on the container, and then we can just populate the content of that track controller. So in this case, we've found a workaround. Like, um, we, we've just been able to pick up our code and move it, move it into our Ember app, and everything's happy. But I've been in situations where like it, where you can't just pick up your code and like move everything into Ember, and I, I have had to go in through this like underscored container before. Um, so in this case, we haven't solved the problem of how to get data into our am application from the outside world, but we we have found a workaround. So if you think where we are now, like if, if you click this play button, the um, the track will start playing, but as soon as we click one of these links, the browser is going to re request the new page um, and load the new page, and, and we're going to lose that playing track. And that, that doesn't make for a very good like, user experience. We want that track to continue playing as we sort of click around and browse around the site. So the solution to this is to like, only load the content that has changed. And a way of doing that is by using PJAX. So, um, PJAX was originally developed uh, for GitHub and using the file browser. And if you click around the file browser there, you'll see that the whole page doesn't reload, just the section 
that's changed loads. And it does this by hijacking all the links on the page. And when you click them, instead of changing the window location, it will fire off an XHR to the server. And the server will deliver back only the content that has changed. And then they change that in the browser. So <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to put this in there because, like, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, TurboLinks is basically a rebranded version of PJAX. Like, DHH came along and uh, rebranded PJAX as TurboLinks and made it a default in every Rails project, which, like, it, it, TurboLinks, like, totally has a bad rep. And it, for the record, it definitely shouldn't be on by default in a Rails app. However, used in the right place, like PJAX or TurboLinks, like, it can be effective. And you speak to people, and most people like, um, GitHub's file browser experience, but if you told any Ember dev that you were building a new app using Turbo Links, like, you should expect a few snidey remarks. But here I am using Ember and Turbo Links like side by side. Um, so just don't tell any Ember core people. Um, but in this case, it's a solution to our problem. We, we, we've started the track playing, and now we can click around the site, and we're not having a full page refresh and the, the track will continue playing so um, you can sort of browse around um, you start to track playing you can click a link you don't lose the track playing but you're seeing the new content um, and every link you click click we're just changing this section of the page so now our ember application is long lived we've taken our ember application outside of the um, like we're making it long live by taking it outside the browser's normal sort of request response um, of the entire page. So there's just one piece remaining, which is like this section, this um, explore similar tracks. So this is um, like a, a paginated tabbed um, list where uh, when you click these tabs or um, move to the next pages, we, we're grabbing content from the server. So given that we're serving up this, um, this section via PJAX, um, how do we make this section? So, so one way um, you could do it would be um, in the PJAX response that you're serving up, you could have some JavaScript there that manually created a view um, and here would creating an instance of the controller, controller and passing that to the view, and then just appending that, that view to the page. And this is, this is the way that you used to do things back, um, back before there was a router, um, like back in the sort of early days of Ember. You'd just sort of create these instances of your view and you'd like, put them on the page where you're going to use them. But if you do this now, you'll get this um, warning that's saying that your view doesn't have a container. Um, so every instance of a view now needs a container. So we could, we could give <laughs> our view uh, our container like this. But again, um, if someone catches you doing that, like we're soon, soon going to end up in this situation like with this API. Um, like, but we've basically hit upon the same problem again. There's no way to access objects within our Ember application um, without going through the container and going, using the container from outside the context of your apps, discouraged. Um, another way to, to do it is rather than create the instance of the view yourself, um, you could uh, look up the view on the, con on the container and that will create the fresh instance of the view with you, um, create the fresh instance of the view for you. So then you're not coupled to the naming of the view. So it's like a win for dependency injection, but it, it doesn't get you away from the underscore container. Likewise, uh, instead of creating the track controller here, um, you could look up uh, the track controller through the container, and that would return you the um, instance of that. And I haven't found a way around this yet. Um, so I've just been using this double underscore container uh, in my code, because there's actually no way to like reach in to the reach into an ember app from outside and like um 
uh, create instances of things or like ch change the change the data in there. So, in working through this case study, um, we've ended up with this hybrid site. We've got a server rendered site that has some Ember enhancements um, and uses uh, PJAX or Turbo Links if you want to cause a reaction, um, so that the Ember components are long lived and are not lost in the normal browser request response behavior. So the point is that Ember's got this great object model. Like there's some really great stuff in there that makes it useful not just for building single page applications. Um, it can be really useful to lean on that object model when you're building complex JavaScript behaviors. It seems that Ember's um, targeting itself solely at being a framework for JavaScript-only web apps, um, apps where Ember's front and center in the application and everything is done through Ember. But hopefully I've shown you a case where Ember isn't a good fit for the whole application, um, but that it can still be used to build parts of your app where it makes sense. And you don't have to use the whole of Ember. You can just ignore the bits that you don't need um, and just uh, use the bits that you do need to enhance your sites. Um, and hopefully when Ember's fully split out into the ES6 modules, it'll become much easier to pick and choose the bits of Ember that you need. Um, one area where I think Ember could be improved is when working with code that lives outside the confines of the uh, Ember app. Um, still not convinced about the double underscore in the container. Like it means that there's no real route into the Ember app. If you want to grab a handle on something inside it, you may find yourself going through the container, which they're discouraging. Um, maybe they just need to expose like a common way of passing messages into the Ember app, like Twitter's flight framework does. It encourages building like these highly decoupled components that communicate by sending and listening for events. And maybe Ember needs something like that, because when you're using Ember as part of your application and not the, the whole of it, like you, you want to build things that are decoupled and like you, you don't want to be reaching in by going through like your double underscored container all the time. So finally, like it's not possible yet, but hopefully one day Ember will be able to work with existing content on the page rather than needing to render everything itself from scratch. Um, so then you'd be able to serve up these server rendered HTML and Ember wouldn't need to throw it all and like re-render everything itself. Um, it could just sort of see what's there and like come in and take over and enhance what's there. And that's it. So if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Shown as an example of using an uh, initializer. So, you, in that same initializer, you could just set those instances to some way where you could reuse them. So, you could have like an ember.globals or something object where you set those instances that you cared about. And then that, that creates this sort of single API for where you can, you can grab instances that you've chosen so, and opted into. So, you're saying uh, in the initializer, look up the things I need from the container. And, and so, yeah, but like that, that, that's the point of the container. The container is um, like where your uh, dependencies are injected into, and that's where you go to look up your things. So uh, like, I don't want to introduce like, another container. Like, I'm, I'm actually happy enough using the container in that way. It's just, um, I guess, I don't necessarily think that it should be discouraged, because I think there are val valid use cases um, for it. So, like I'm happy enough sort of accessing the container like that in certain circumstances. I think I guess, I guess what you hinted at was that it's a private API and that 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 variable name could change. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely uh, that's definitely something that you're opening yourself up to if you if you do that. But um, I think there are there are other ways of doing it from what I've. Uh, presented here, um, other ways of sort of getting data into the app, but um, I, I just wanted to walk through some cases where I think it made sense that you wanted to do something from outside the Ember 
sort of wall and show that they're discouraging it, but I think there are valid use cases for it. Any more? If you had to start this again, would you do it the same way? Um, yeah, like I, th I, um, I, I was aiming to uh, demonstrate the choices that I'd made like along the way, um, and that is the way that I would um, still build it now. Like I, I want server rendered HT HTML. Like when it's a when it's a publicly accessible site delivering content. Like I, I just want that to be server rendered. Like I, I want that to be served up so that. Like it works without JavaScript, so that it works when, like, it, like I've just got multiple reasons for like sort of um, wanting that server rendered HTML served up. Um, but then um, I, I wanted the experience where you could browse around the application whilst um, having a like this this, this track playing. And it, if it was um, a site with no JavaScript at all, like that would be you, you'd lose it every new page you navigated to. So like the solution to that was PJAX, and and M Ember came in when I wanted to start building more complex behavior. So, so yeah, basically I would do things the same way if I rebuilt it. Yes, so um, the question was how much of, of a win do I think I've had using Ember um, over just plain uh, jQuery and um, things? And um, the answer to that is like a, a lot. Um, I, I, I found that I've, I've become so accustomed to um, using this object model that Ember, Ember offers. and. Um, the things like the computer properties and the bindings that allow you just to st start working in higher and higher level abstractions as you build out your code and start achieving like much more complicated be behavior than you would than I, I personally would get to if I just started throwing some um, jQuery together. And um, yeah, like I say, that like that's an object model that. Um, I like, I'm familiar with it, and I like to lean on that when I'm, whenever I start doing anything complex. So for something simple like clicking a, a link and having a YouTube video play, like, that's fine just in jQuery. But as soon as it started becoming this, um, uh, like enqueuing multiple tracks and reordering and sort of sharing those playlists, or, you, you know, mani like becoming like a playlist manager, that's when Ember really sort of starts to shine with like the, um, with, with its object model. All done? I can do that one. Oh, no. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm thinking, so, so, is the answer like some sort of HTML markup that has embedded data in it? So actually, like, the HTML is readable, but like Ember data could like sideload? Like, yeah, um, I, I don't know how, uh, like, I don't know how Ember would come in and start working with the um, content that was already there and just sort of slot in. But um, apparently, um, uh, Angular works with existing content on the page. Um, I, I don't know how they do it. Like, I haven't looked into Angular so much, but I, I guess whatever data you've got on the page that isn't marked up in a way that could uh, easily be pulled out, like you would need to add in via data attributes or, or, or whatever. Like you need to make sure all that data is there, I guess. All right, thank you.